these should be exciting papers. We'll cover these, some of these, hopefully next week if we get to it. Uh, they'll be on multi threading It's an important topic. Uh, that's another research area uh, that you can work on, actually, for, for your projects. How to exploit the multi threading substrate for something. So if you read these papers, maybe that, they'll give you some ideas. Then you can certainly read more papers after this. I know one of you have read uh, one of the papers. Okay. Other recommended papers, uh, I probably want to cover uh, related to heterogeneity. I guess I randomly picked two of them. So if you're interested, you can uh, look at these two papers. One is on core fusion. When we, uh, we talked about this briefly last time, you start with small cores and you somehow fuse them to operate as a large core. How does it work? Well, this paper will tell you, except uh, it's a nightmare to implement. So if you actually get to it, if you actually cover it, I'll tell you exactly why it's a nightmare to implement. It's, it's very difficult to get it to work without losing significant performance. And this is uh, one of my students for a childhood paper on stage memory scheduling. Uh, it looks into how to do memory scheduling when you have a CPU and a GPU on the same chip and they share the memory control. So these, these could give you some ideas on research also. Okay. The last lecture we covered an early history of multi-core. I gave you uh, the path two big companies have taken, Sun and IBM. Uh, one of them is dead, the other is alive, I guess. And they've taken different paths uh, in multi-core. We talked about, uh, well, homogeneous multi-core evolution. Uh, I presented within the context of those two companies. And they were trying to achieve something, and I propose that they're trying to achieve the best of multiple worlds, but they're not going to get it without some sort of asymmetry. <coughs> In fact, they, they move to asymmetry also, right? Fre frequency boosting is one way of achieving asymmetry, <coughs> and we will see, we'll cover that uh, paper that described that first. So today we'll uh, talk more on asymmetric multicore, and maybe talk about asymmetry in general. If you've done the reviews, uh, we'll, cover some, we'll cover the papers uh, you reviewed. So hopefully you'll have some opinions on some of those papers. But I'd like to go through those relatively fast if we get to them. Okay, any questions before we start? Everybody is working on their project proposals. I think I've talked to many groups, but not all. This is another review. We remember we were talking about two approaches to design multi-core. By a large approach, you have large cores put together, and by a small approach, you have many small cores put together. Uh, and none of them achieve the best of both worlds. So if you have both of them, you can get performance asymmetry, and that enables hopefully best of both worlds. Why? Because you can execute the serial parts uh, of the code in the large core and the parallel part on all of the small cores. And if you have multi-threading on the large core, then you can get as good parallel performance as this pile small approach, and hopefully as good serial performance as this pile large approach. And remember this, this, this was the, uh, I introduced EPI throttling. Uh, this was one of the first papers that introduced uh, what, what's called turbo boost now, which is increasing the frequency of a machine uh, when you have only one thread. Right? That's one way of achieving dynamic asymmetry. And the idea is, uh, their goal was to minimize execution time of parallel programs when you had a fixed power question. How, how can you do this? If you express power as EPI times IPS, EPI means energy per instructions times instructions per second. In phases where you have lots of instructions per second, which means that phases you have lots of parallelism, lots of instructions per second, you can have lots of processors where EPI is low, energy per instruction is low. This is the ideal multi-core in a sense. Uh, whereas in phases where you have, you don't have lots of instructions per second, the serial phases, you can boost the EPI. And one way of doing that is by increasing the frequency, significantly. And there are many other ways of doing that, we covered briefly. If you remember the dark chart, I don't have it right now, but 
that dark chart talks about different ways of doing that, asymmetric multiple or speculation control, uh, or shutting down some pipeline resources. Okay. And one way of achieving it is uh, using DBFS. Because when you have low thread parallelism, run a few cores at high supply voltage at high frequency. When you have high thread parallelism, run many cores at low supply voltage and low frequency. And that's what this paper did. This is ISCA uh, 2005, uh, mitigating Amdahl's law uh, via, via EPI traveling. Uh, and they took a real system uh, and configured it to be statically asymmetric. How can you do this? You can have, uh, let's say, four cores. Three of them are dedicated to par parallel phases, and they run at 1.25 gigahertz. And you have one core dedicated to sequential phase, and it runs at 2 gigahertz. And you guarantee, through affinity settings in the operating system, in the program, uh, that the sequential phase runs on one processor and the parallel phase runs on the three processors. And they did this on a real system. Uh, and they used this approach for benchmarks that rapidly transition between sequential and par parallel phases. They also had a version of something like this, but dynamic. They can change the duty cycles during program run through operating system calls. Uh, in this case, they enabled parallel phases to run on all or a subset of four processors, depending on how many threads you have. And sequential phases were forced to run on a single processor at 2 gigahertz. I think the parallel phases were uh, run on the four processors with 1.25 gigahertz. And they used this approach for benchmarks with long sequential and parallel phases. If you have a long parallel phase, uh, then uh, you want to have all of the clusters working on your parallel phase. Here, if you're rapidly transitioning between sequential and parallel phases, you might as well dedicate one processor for the sequential phase. That's why they did it. I mean, you can question their design choice, of course. So, I guess what did they do? They, uh, this was their system at the time. It was a four-way, two gigahertz Xeon. So it wasn't even, uh, these were four different processors. They were not, as far as I know, they were not multiple processors. There were four processors connected uh, via cache coherent substrate. That's a good question. Or maybe someone can check that. So they hand modified the programs uh, to uh, enable static and dynamic asymmetric multiple for these different applications. And this is what I already described to you. Make sense? And these are some of the programs uh, that were run on the static configuration. And these were some of the programs that were run on the dynamic configuration. It looks like parallel phases ran on four processors with one gigahertz in the dynamic configuration. And they could boost the frequency to two gigahertz if there was a serial phase. Now, what did they gain? These are the performance results that, that are reported in that paper. Uh, this is a speed up normalized to uh, one processor running at 2 gigahertz. And this is the asymmetric uh, per performance of the asymmetric multiprocessor. And this is the performance of the four, four processors that are running at 1 gigahertz. Does that make sense? Comparison points. So this is a single uh, speed up compared to a single core that's running fast. This is the symmetric multicore and this is the asymmetric multicore. Except it's not a multicore, I think it's a multiprocessor. If you look at these applications, there's significant gain here uh, compared to uh, of asymmetric multicore compared to symmetric multicore. And these applications do not gain that much. And it looks like these applications lose regardless of uh, regardless of what you do. I think they did not tune the application very well. Does that make sense? So that's, that's the benefit of asymmetric multicore, where, where you have these applications where you have uh, serial phases, you can boost the frequency and get out of those serial phases quickly, either statically or dynamically. They did not see improvements in some applications, even though there, there were significant serial uh, phases. 
you can read the paper for more detail. I used to assign this paper, but I want to assign you different papers now, more cutting edge papers. Um, why, why would frequency boosting uh, asymmetric multiprocessor not improve performance? We covered this before briefly, right? So even though they had applications where you had uh, some serial phases, they would not see performance then. That with memory latency. That's right. So, so some of those phases were actually uh, well, memory locked. But this, uh, I'll, I'll skip this. Then. I think you can mitigate that problem. Basically, you're saying this boosting frequency does not help memory bomb cases. So, uh, they also ran into issues when they had rapid transitions between serial and parallel phases. In that case, they needed to, uh, they ran to throttling overhead because they need to change the frequency and the voltage. And that's in time. So that's one of the, there, there's an overhead uh, to changing the frequency and voltage, and that's one of the reasons they did not. Uh, see performance benefits, uh, especially when the serial phase was short. Because you cannot advertise the overhead uh, of ramping up frequency and voltage. And in some cases, they lost throughput uh, in the static version of the asymmetric multiprocessor. And hopefully you should be familiar with this because you read the papers that I've assigned. If, you, uh, if you're reducing your parallel performance on the, in the parallel phase. If you don't have a lot of processors to begin with, then you can lose performance. And in this case, they had only four processors. And uh, in the parallel part, portion of the code, they were running only three of them. Which means that whenever they have four threads in the baseline system, symmetric multi-core system, they would have only three threads in the uh, in the asymmetric multi core system in the parallel portion. So there's a 25% loss of throughput in the parallel portion when you're going from symmetric to asymmetric, which is pretty high. You have to overcome that somehow right, to get the performance improvement. Okay. I encourage you to read that paper. That's actually uh, a nicely written paper. Uh, I don't think a lot of people recognize uh, that that's one of the first papers that proposed this frequency view boosting. I don't think it's given enough credit in the community. It's ISCA 2005. Okay, what did we cover? Uh, I think we've covered all of this. Right? And we've covered asymmetric multicore, functional. We did cover functional asymmetry, but we briefly covered functional asymmetry. Right? We have CPU plus GPU, that's kind of functional asymmetry, different ISAs. We may get back to that when we, after we cover GPUs. We covered static versus dynamic asymmetry and API traveling as one example of achieving either static or dynamic asymmetry. Let's take a look at some of the trade-offs in asymmetric multi-core. I think you already read this in, the, in one of the papers, hopefully, the accelerated critical section of the paper. But the trade-offs exist regardless, regardless of what you're accelerating on the large form. One big trade-off, uh, as I told you many times in the 447, there's a big trade-off between the hardware architect's job versus the programmer's job, right? Asymmetry is, in a way, uh, making programmers' life easier. But it's making the hardware architect, the microarchitect's job harder. Why? Because now the microarchitect needs to design asymmetry into the system, multiple cores potentially, and somehow a mechanism to switch between but now the programmer doesn't need to worry about the serial sections as much. Because serial sections are going to be boosted by a very fast form. So that's what I said. I think. For performance of the program becomes less dependent on the length of the serial part. Which means that the programmer doesn't need to optimize the, uh, their code as much. That's what this says. Uh, the other uh, trade-off I hope this is clear. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. The other trade-off is you have migration overhead or some sort of overhead to switch between, uh, switch to the past mode, if you will. If you're doing a frequency boosting, dynamic frequency boosting, you need to ramp up the voltage and frequency. It takes some time to do this. If you have a large core and you migrate the serial section, 
that part. You need to either migrate the data or the code, and it takes time to do that. Uh, that's the overhead that comes with asymmetric, an asymmetric design. Uh, but the benefit is you're accelerating some sort of bottleneck, right? It could be a serial bottleneck in this case, and in your paper, in the paper you reviewed, uh, it was the critical sections, uh, or the barriers, or slow pipeline stages. I'll cover these without asking you for now. So the benefit is uh, you get a performance gain from here, but then you get performance loss from here. And there, there, the performance loss comes from multiple things, right? You, uh, you may need to switch the architectural state to the large core, depending on whether or not that large core already had the architectural state. In the papers, you review if the large core already had that architectural state. So that might be a problem. If you're executing the serial portion of the large query, it incurs cache misses when it needs data generated by a parallel portion. All of the parallel clusters, uh, the parallel portion is running on other clusters, and when the serial portion starts on the large core, it needs to gather that data if it needs. Similarly, the parallel portion incurs cache misses when it needs data by the uh, generated by the serial portion. And hopefully you've seen some uh, papers that try to marshal the data earlier. This one last trade-off is, and this is not necessarily uh, true, because you can have multi-threading in the large core, uh, in the asymmetric uh, case, you have fewer threads. If you dedicate the large core to only serial sections or critical sections, right? in the parallel portion, then you have only the, you have a fewer number of threads. The trade-off is you're accelerating the serial volume. So you get performance gain because of acceleration, but performance loss due to the unavailability of some number of threads. Make sense? Of course, this need not be the case. You can have the large core. You can implement multi-threading in the large core, but such that all of your hardware resources are available for. Uh, the maximum number of threads you would have, as in the symmetric case. And even if you do not do that, as the number of cores on chip or threads on chip increases, the downside of this fewer threads, the downside of dedicating a large core to uh, a particular task decreases. The fraction of loss of throughput in the parallel mm, portion decreases. Does that make sense? For example, in the Four core case, they were dedicating one core uh, to the serial uh, section. The fractional loss of throughput in parallel portion is 25% in that case, right? Whereas if you had 64 cores and dedicated only one core for the serial section, then your fractional loss of throughput is only one divided by 64. Okay. Okay. So we'll cover. Uh, a bunch of other uses of asymmetry. And uh, I would encourage you to think of other uses. Uh, this will be more of a researchy lecture. Uh, going forward into the future, as I will uh, tell you in a few slides, uh, asymmetry is a very good way of enabling uh, very high efficiency as well as very high performance at the same time. So far, you've covered improving serial performance, at least in lectures. You read papers that do other things. Uh, and this already exists in existing clusters, right? So you can do a frequency boost boosting. We already have dynamic asymmetry. But what else can we do with asymmetry? Any, any thoughts? Save power. Save power. Improve energy efficiency. That's right. <laughs> you could reduce energy, or you could achieve a better energy performance trade-off. And you already read the paper, so that answer wouldn't count at this point, perhaps. <laughs> you can improve the parallel portion also, and we'll get to that. Anything else? Yes? Improve functionality on chip, like uh, the GPU on, on chip versus having it as a separate uh, off-chip communication. That's right. Yeah, you could you could do that. 
That's more of a benefit of integration, though, when you say you can move functionality. You're moving some asymmetric functionality that used to exist outside the chip onto the chip. And that that's, in, in the end, enable, uh, enables many things, which is reducing costs, potentially saving system power, overall system power. What else? Anything else you, you can enable? Maybe you guys can think of it. So, actually one of the first papers that talked about uh, improving energy efficiency with asymmetry is this one. Called single ice heterogeneous multiple architectures. Uh, the idea was very simple. You could put multiple types of cores on the chip and monitor the characteristics of running threads at any given time. Uh, one way of doing that, you could potentially sample the energy per performance you're getting on each thread. And dynamically pick the core that provides the best energy performance trade-off for a given phase. That was the idea. I'd encourage you to read the paper. Uh, and best core, of course, depends on the optimization metric. But I'll give you uh, an example with some with the pictures from the paper, I guess. So what they did was they took uh, old alpha processors, the EV series. This is the EV4, EV5, EV6, and EV8, which never saw the day of light. Where you can think of this alpha 21, 264, 21, 464, and 21, 164, and 21, 0, 64. Uh, and they scaled. Uh, and these are cores from different technology generations, right? And they scaled the size of this to, I guess, 0.10 micrometers. Is that 100 nanometers? I guess that's pretty good. 100 nanometers. And it turns out when you scale the size of these cores to the same technology generation, EV8, which is a very heavily multi-threaded auto-border engine, uh, turns out to be 80 times the size of this EV4 core in terms of area. Interesting, I think. <laughs> and if, if you look at the performance, according to what they say in the paper, it provides two to three times higher single thread performance. So that square root law doesn't work, I guess, right? At least for this. The square root of 80 is 9, not 2 to 2 or 3. Because technically it's not 9, it's only plus than 9. <laughs> I'm rounding up. <laughs> okay? And they, they did some calculations. This is, if you look at the, uh, this table, you can read this table from that bar. Uh, this tells you the peak power, average power, and performance of these four different cores on single thread. So peak power of EV4, which is a single issue in order engine, is 5 watts. Uh, and EV8 is about 93 watts. And performance is 1 normalized versus 2.14. Now you have an energy performance trade-off, right? Uh, and if you look at the peak power in the middle, uh, you get or, or average power, you get a trade-off. So what they uh, did was they, I think this is the profile of the same thread if it's executed on different cores. This is the committed instructions. And y axis is the instructions per second. How many instructions per second is retired from this thread? And if you look at this, there are some phases of this thread where it doesn't matter that much which core the thread is executing on. Instruction per second is instructions per second is relatively similar. Whereas there are some other phases where IPS is very different between different cores. For example, here, EV8 provides much higher IPS here compared to, uh, compared to EV4. So if you can somehow monitor uh, some metric, you can switch between the different cores to get uh, a good energy performance trade-off, depending on what you're optimizing for. You could be optimizing for, uh, I guess, uh, performance per watt, right? You could monitor the instruction per second uh, on different cores, and if you decide to switch to the core that provides you the best performance per watt. 
question is how do you do that? You run, let's say the thread is running on one core, how do you know what performance per watt you're going to get on the other core? Any ideas? No ideas? Nobody has any guesses? Well, one thing you could do is you could sample, right? You could run the thread uh, on all the cores and see what performance per watt you're getting. Because you can monitor performance and you can monitor power. And then decide, oh, this core gave me the best performance per watt in this phase, so I'm going to switch to that core in the next phase. That could be one algorithm. May not be the best one because now you're losing a lot of throughput. That's what they did. I think in this paper it doesn't have a very realistic algorithm. That's the downside of the paper. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's kind of magically discovers <laughs> which core is good. But assuming that you could do that, uh, this is the core, this is the best core you select. If you're, if you're optimizing for energy only. So you're not always executing on EV4. You're actually executing most of the time on EV6 if you're optimizing for total energy, according to these results. If you're optimizing for energy delay, this is what they found. I encourage you to read the paper. But does this make sense? So this is one way of visualizing multiple uh, different types of cores to optimize for energy or energy delay. There are open research questions here. How do, you, how do you figure out what your performance would be on a different core while you're running on this core? For example, if you had the ability to switch a program seamlessly from a CPU to a GPU, how do you decide to do that? Assume that you could, you could seamlessly uh, execute the same program on the CPU and the GPU. And I strongly believe that this will happen in the future. Uh, how do you decide whether you should execute this program on the CPU versus the GPU while the program is executing only on one of them? So you somehow need to have a model of what performance or what power you would have gotten if you were executing on this other type of form. If you can build a model like that, that would be very valuable for many things. You could do the scheduling in hardware, you could do the scheduling in the operating system. You provide this model to programmers such that they understand what happens, although you may not want to do that for all programmers. But that's, that's an interesting research direction, certainly. Not, not necessarily only for CPU or GPU, but also this type of course as well. Okay. I guess what are the advantages of using asymmetry to improve energy efficiency on the PPU? <laughs> so you get more flexibility in your energy performance trade off. Right? Now you enable, look at this, uh, if you look at this uh, range of energy and range of performance, it's a big range. You can consume 5 watts versus 95 watts, almost. And you can get 1x performance versus 2x performance. And you can probably design better for that yet, more than 2x performance here. And if you can do so, you can execute the computation uh, on the core that is best suited for that computation. Ideally, if you can identify, if you can dynamically generate the core that is best suited for the computation you have, maybe that's the best you can do in terms of energy efficiency. Maybe that's the limit of your energy efficiency. It's not clear how you would do that, but it's a, it's a, it's a good, worthy goal to strive for. Of course, there are disadvantages. I think some of these disadvantages we already covered. Well, we did not cover this one. But if you, what if you decide the core incorrectly? Then, of course, you may lose efficiency. Because you may be executing on a heavy core when you're not benefiting from that heavy core, large core. There is a always the overhead of switching between the cores. You may need to migrate data uh, instructions. And all kinds of disadvantages of asymmetric multi-core are still there. 
then you need algorithms to somehow monitor these phases and match the best form to that phase. And there are lots of uh, questions related to that. I think I'll cover this in a little bit more detail in a few slides. So. This is the paper actually you read, right? So we covered using asymmetry for energy efficiency, but you can do you can use asymmetry to improve parallel portion performance as well. And you read the papers. If you shift the critical section to a large core, you can improve performance in the parallel section. So I'll not cover this right now. Instead, I'll switch some, switch gears and uh, talk about asymmetry everywhere. <laughs> so why can't we extend this notion? So far, we've been talking about cores only, right? But there's nothing fundamental about just a core. Why can't we have asymmetry everywhere in the system? You can have asymmetric uh, caches. You can have asymmetric interconnects. You can have asymmetric memory controllers. You can have asymmetric memories. Does that sound reasonable? No? <laughs> some, some of you are smiling. I would argue that it's actually, uh, maybe that's how you can optimize for energy and performance at the same time in the best way. Well, let me give you some of the slides that I have actually covered uh, in one of the NSF uh, National Science Foundation workshops on what direction should computer architecture or computer design take into the future. So this will be high level and somewhat speculative, but hopefully that will give you an idea of what direction computer architectures may be taking going into the future. So if you look at the design of systems today, what we're increasingly having, on-chip, off-chip, in a cluster, even across the world, uh, are hardware resources that are shared among many different applications. Like when you execute something, when you go to a website, do you know where that code is executing? It could be executing in Google's data center and I don't know, wherever they have data centers. Right. So you have this big hardware resource that exists everywhere, and chip is a small scale version of it, uh, that is shared among many threads and applications. And I call it the mini core system here, because it's long. And then, what are these resources? If you look at a single system, cores, caches, interconnects, memory, disks, power, lifetime, all of these can be considered resources that are shared by many things, many applications. And management of these resources is a very difficult task. Think about who decides what, uh, where your code executes. When you submit a job to a cluster, uh, somebody needs to decide where that, where that executes. Uh, and wh why is this very difficult? If you look at a multi-core system, let's constrain ourselves again. When you're designing a parallel program or multi-program workload, if you want to optimize the performance, these resources are shared and it becomes difficult to optimize performance because threads interact unpredictably, unpredictably in these resources. Right? You know this very well from um, your previous courses. When you have a memory scheduler that's unfair, one thread can be denied service for a while. Now, how do you schedule computation on uh, these shared resources when you do not know how the threads will behave? And arguably, power and energy consumption is the most valuable shared resource because you cannot increase that. You're limited by how much power you can supply to a chip or a data center or a cell phone. And this is the main limiter to energy efficiency and performance. Uh, so, a lot of the things that I said before is true, which is the programmer is a very valuable resource also. That's a different kind of resource. And the programmer uh, already has a hard time writing sequential software. How many of you guys have written simple programs and uh, without any bugs at all? Anybody? I'm going to give you a prize if you actually had no bugs in your code so far. Yeah. Did I hear someone? 
Okay. How many of you have written parallel programs without worrying about shared resources uh, and didn't have any bugs? Have you written any parallel programs? <laughs> yeah, you have probably. Well, hopefully. Uh, and even if you don't need to worry about where do these threads execute, it's very difficult to write these parallel programs. But now let's say you want to optimize the performance of multiple threads. You're writing a program that has 100 threads. And you want to optimize its performance. And to be able to do that, uh, and this, these threads are executing on these shared resources, let's say. Memory that's shared between many threads. And you have no idea which thread is uh, getting prioritized over the other one. How would you optimize that program? I guess the right answer is I don't know. <laughs> Could be. So it's very difficult to even write the program, even write a sequential program, if you expose these shared resources, caches, uh, memory scheduler, or even multiple threads on the same floor to the programmer, it'll be a nightmare for the programmers. So programmers should not worry about hardware resource management. And there are cases where programmers actually worried about hardware resource management. If you look at a lot of supercomputers, programmers worried about the hardware resource management. Uh, if you look at GPUs today, programmers still worry about hardware resource management. Right? You need to figure out how to lay out your data such that it maps to different banks so that you do not get conflicts between different threads when they access your data. And I would argue that that's a nightmare. It is a nightmare if you're programming GPUs, I think. I don't know, is it a nightmare? Yes, it is. So the programmer should not be uh, worrying about this. Uh, worrying about what should be executed where with what resources. Where should the data get mapped? That should not be a programmer's job going into the future. So future computer architecture should be designed to minimize programmer effort, to optimize parallel programs, but somebody needs to do this management, right? You cannot avoid it. Somebody needs to map the data to uh, these banks, uh, memory banks in a GPU, memory system. And that should be an automatic. And that should be the runtime system that hopefully some smart programmers design. Or maybe some library-based runtime system that's, that gives you a virtualization layer if you would like to think of it that way. Programmer writes programs. In between the hardware and the program, you have this runtime system, or hypervisor, someone might call it. You could think of all of that being the same. Uh, that maps the programs and the data to the underlying resource. And that resource could be, again, anything, right? It could be, you could think of, uh, you could think of uh, having your program written and while it's running on your cell phone, this runtime system decides to ship part of your program to some, somewhere in the cloud, in some data center. You have hardware resource on your cell phone, you have resource on the cloud. How do you decide, how does the runtime system decide where it takes you? Okay. So, if the programmer is not managing these shared resources, uh, the system should manage power and performance automatically across these applications. And I think there are three major goals. One is we would like to minimize energy and power consumption, for sure. While satisfying performance requirements, and we will talk about this later on, but you've seen it in earlier courses. And we would, of course, like to minimize program errors. And this, if you, if you look at everything from this context, there's no question that you have to have asymmetry or configurability in your resources. Because if you do not have that, you have no choice. If everything is symmetric, like this, then you have no choice in terms of energy or performance. If your program requires more than this resource, you're not going to get uh, high performance. Well, you can say that programmers should paralyze the program, but that goes against the programmer. Uh, effort argument. And if your system, uh, 
if your uh, computation requires less than this resource, and specifically I'm not calling it a core because it can be any resource, mm -hmm. then it will be suboptimal because you've given it more than it needs. So asymmetric, if you look at an asymmetric system, it enables us trade-offs and customization, and that's the main benefit of an asymmetric system, that en enabling of the trade-off. Because processing requirements vary across applications and phases, you can execute the code on the best fed resources. If you need more, you execute the code on this big C1. If you need less, you execute the code on the small C5. So that's the benefit of asymmetry. So if you take this, uh, I'll, I'll remain within the chip for now, I guess, but if you take this, uh, to the, the limits, if you will, you, you can design each hardware resource with asymmetric components. If you look at the cores, you can have big high power, high performance cores, some medium cores, even smaller cores, and many, many small cores. Uh, you could design the caches in different ways such that they're optimized for different access patterns. Maybe, maybe you don't have caches in some, for some access patterns, like you have stream buffers, which we've talked about previous courses. Mm -hmm. Or maybe for, for different access patterns, you uh, have different uh, memory hierarchies. Basically, each resource, main memory including, uh, can, be, can have the asymmetry that enables different power performance, maybe reliability characteristics. And this can fit different computation, access, and communication patterns. And you can design the runtime system cooperatively in hardware and software to automatically choose the best bit components for each phase. The runtime system has the smarts, if you will, to stitch together the best bit chip. It has this pool of resources and says, I'm going to take this medium core from here, and this hierarchy from here, and this interconnect from here, and this main memory from here, and allocate it to this particular computation phase that I have at hand that I know a lot about based on some past information or based on something uh, that's given to me. That way maybe among this pool of resources you can carve out the best fit chip for that phase. And if you have this, maybe there's another opportunity. You can have software that's written or translated uh, to execute on multiple co components and the runtime system can choose between the software components also to be able to achieve this task. You know, your task may be, what could it be? What do you do mostly? Playing Angry Birds. <laughs> if you to play Angry Birds, you can have different software. And they could be, it could be fit for executing on different resources. If you're running very low on your battery, for example, maybe your Angry Birds will execute on the cloud and there will be another uh, software it could be written in a different, and probably usually it is different, it's written in a different uh, code base to execute on the cloud versus to execute on your cell phone. So you can morph the software components to match different hardware components, but you can imagine that it's on the same chip as well. So you can have multiple versions for different resource characteristics, and depending on the availability of some of the resources, you can execute the code, and execute different code to accomplish the same task on these resources. So that's the idea of asymmetry everywhere. This is a summary of it. So how do we get there? It's of course not easy. There are many research and design questions that I'll leave you with. How do you design these asymmetric components? What monitoring do you perform cooperatively in hardware and software to achieve this? How do you characterize the pace? You could do it at different granularities also, right? You could do it at granularities of tens of instructions. Or you could do it at granularities of you know, much larger software components. That's another, that's another question. What's the granularity at which you decide uh, what resources you allocate to a particular computation? How do you design the feedback control loop between the hardware components and the system software? And how do you design the runtime to automatically manage these resources? These are very big research challenges. A 
hopefully give you some small baby steps, or maybe you've already seen some of the baby steps in the papers. Okay, this is summary, I'll just move on. So how do we get there? I don't know if you'll be able to cover all of this in this lecture, but some, I'll give you some examples first, and then we'll cover quickly uh, some of the things you read. And we'll also go into asymmetry in memory, and we'll continue uh, on asymmetry in memory on uh, Friday. OK, some examples. You've already seen uh, these examples, right? You can execute the serial sections or critical sections on high power, high performance cores, and non-critical sections or non-bottlenecks on low power, low performance cores. What is the benefit now that the programmer can write less optimized but more likely correct programs? And can improve both power and energy efficiency. And the, and the papers you read, the bottleneck identification and scheduling, the uh, accelerated critical sections, it shows that you can improve performance. But it turns out that it improves energy efficiency also. What else can you do? You can have different memory hierarchies, uh, some optimized for streaming, and some optimized for random access. And depending on what accesses you're making to different pieces of data, you can allocate the data to different hierarchies. That way you can get higher efficiency and higher performance than a general purpose hierarchy. Because if you're doing random access, and if you have caches, if you have a very multi-level cache hierarchy, L1, L2, L3, L4 caches, then you move that data that you're never going to reuse into all of your caches and then move it back after you write to it. So what's the point of doing that, right? Why not, for example, maybe when you're doing random access, maybe you should be doing that random access very close to memory. Maybe you move the computation closer to memory, and that could be a hierarchy that's optimized for random access. Or maybe you have a streaming buffer. If, even if you're streaming, just purely streaming without any reuse, caches are not very effective. You just need a small streaming buffer where you stream the data and use it, maybe write to it, and then push it back to memory. You don't need this big bulky cache hierarchy that's really optimized for optimized for reuse. Right? If you don't have reuse, either temporal or spatial, uh, then your caches are not very useful. In fact, they're very inefficient. They add latency and they add power consumption because you're keeping this data that's not being used. Yeah. And that could be another interesting topic, by the way, another uh, research topic that to do in this class if you're still looking for research topics. We have talked about this in previous uh, uh, classes, and we will probably get to it again, especially for the on-chip network part. Uh, you can have different kinds of uh, or partitionable memory controllers, partitionable uh, interconnect. And based on the threads different needs, you can partition the bandwidth asymmetrically. Because some threads need more, some thread, threads need, need less. Or you can have different kinds of uh, memory scheduling policies, for example, for different types of threads. And dynamically, you can choose the memory scheduling policy depending on what thread is executed. I guess we haven't covered all of this at 447. So some threads could be bandwidth sensitive, some threads could be latency sensitive. If you can dynamically distinguish between those threads, you may want to employ, employ different policies for those threads. For the latency sensitive threads, you really would like to prioritize them over other threads. So they need the quick data from main memory. For bandwidth sensitive threads, you really want, if you have many bandwidth sensitive threads, you want all of them to make some progress, get their bandwidth. And we will talk about some scheduling policies where uh, bandwidth sensitive threads uh, the memory controller round robins among the bandwidth sensitive threads such that each thread gets its chance to get the bandwidth it needs. So you can have different scheduling policies. Or you can have a main memory at this level with different technology characteristics. This is, we will go into this in more detail on Friday. But the idea is maybe you don't want all DRAM in main memory because it may be very costly. 
may be very inefficient, right? may re require refresh. But if you have some other technology that has better energy characteristics, uh, for example, phase change memory, or some other memory technology, uh, magnetic memory, that doesn't require refresh, now you have a choice. Yeah. Could be non volatile it doesn't require refresh, now you have multiple memory technologies, and you can place the data that's latest latency critical to DRAM, but other data that's not latency critical to some other memory technology that's relatively slow, but doesn't consume as much energy. So you can map pages and applications to the best of memory resource. So you can build the entire system this way. And wouldn't the world be much more efficient if you could do this?
pipeline stages. Uh, you guys know about pipeline parallel programs? Have you written any of those? No? If you know about them? You read the this paper, right? It's called like identification and scheduling. But you can, one way of parallelizing programs is writing them in a pipeline parallel fashion, which is you can think of it this way. Let's say you have a loop, for a loop, for a while loop, it doesn't matter, and some code, A, B, C. And this A, B, and C communicate little with each other. There's some communication, but not a whole lot. And you have these different loop iterations. <coughs> what you can do is you can uh, parallelize A, B, and C from different loop iterations. So you can actually do this. You can have processor one, processor two, processor three. Processor one is dedicated for executing A's, processor two executing B's, processor three executing C's. It doesn't need to be dedicated. And you have loop iteration A0, A1, A2 here. B0, B1, B2, dot, 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 executed here. C0, C1, C2, dot, 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 executed here. This is one way of parallelizing a loop iteration. Yes? Um, I think I didn't really understand what you mean by the paper on this, but um, say that there's no inter iteration dependency, like if you have a for loop that's summing to some later register. Right? That's right, yeah, that will be difficult to parallelize potentially. And is it generally true that it, I guess in most code you don't have a kind of dependency? It seems like that might occur fairly quickly. Yeah, if you have a cross iteration dependency, that's, that's a different. That's a difficult parallelize loop. And that's not so common that this is just probably, so it's rare enough that this is still useful. Yeah, this is still used in many programs. It's not, I wouldn't say it's rare enough. There are many programs where you have iteration dependencies. But that's, and we will cover how to parallelize some of those. Yeah. But that's that's the that's the tough part of parallel parallel programming, right? So if you have iteration dependencies, how do you, how do you parallelize? So in this case, uh, one reason to do this kind of parallelization is, is these A's may be working on some data set that you want to keep local in processor one. And these B's may be working on some data set that you want to keep local here. And these C's could be working some, on some data set you want to keep local there. That way you can get better locality as well. So that's the idea. That's, this is one way of doing pipeline parallels. Make sense? So in this case, if you have this, uh, basically different stages are executing on different threads and potentially on different cores. Now the slowest stage makes other stages wait. And there are other issues if you have any of these, there's a load imbalance issue to break down. But that slowest stage becomes on, uh, on the critical path. So let's take a look at critical sections first. You know what those are, so I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip this also. But this is a real example from a real database system, but you can, it's high level, so you can actually look at the code. Uh, let's say you have, uh, I'll give you a hooked up example, but a real uh, micro benchmark like example, uh, where you have uh, 12 loop iterations. And 33% of the instructions of the loop iteration are in the critical section. So if you execute this on a single processor, this is what the execution time would look like. There's some critical section that the processor is executing, and it's 33% of the time. So you'd execute it in 12 time units. Of course, critical section doesn't matter in this case, right? Because there are no, uh, there are multiple threads. If you execute this on two processors, this is what the execution time would look like. You get benefit from uh, parallelization. And when one thread is executing the critical section, the other thread cannot execute. So there's some serialization. If you execute this on three threads or three processors, this is the performance you get. You still gain performance. Now, if you add one more thread, you can no longer improve performance. Because now what happened is here, the program is critical section bound for you. At any given time, 
one of the three threads is executing the critical section. And if you parallelize the program more, add one more thread, you don't gain performance. In fact, if you run this on a real system, you will lose performance. Why? That's right, yes. Because if you add one more thread, you're not gaining performance, obviously, because your your performance is bound by the critical section. But now, one more thread is locking and unlocking and accessing shared data, which means you're moving more data. Uh, well, you you're doing mm, you have one more processor where the data is moved to. And there's overhead of locking and unlocking operations too. So you would normally lose performance going from three to four. There's another reason, which is the resource contention. You could, you could actually be contending for the cache and uh, uh, main memory more when you have more threads. So if you magically accelerate the critical section by twice, this is what you would get. In a single processor, you would get some performance improvements. With two threads, you would get some more. With three threads, again, you would improve performance. And with four threads, you would improve performance also. But if you look at this, now, program scales from going from three to four threads. The performance actually improves going from three to four threads if you accelerate the critical sections. Because you are no more critical section bound here in terms of your execution time. So that's the uh, insight. Accelerating critical sections increases performance and scalability. And how do you achieve that? You already know the answer. Uh, I guess I'll give you an example uh, from a real application, MySQL. This is as you increase the number of threads in terms of chip area. Uh, this is the performance you would get. This is, this is a very common speed up curve. It's called parallel speed up curve. Uh, speed up of uh, this is with a single thread, your speed up is one. It's the speed up normalized with a single thread. And as you add more threads, you get better performance up to this point. At 16 or so threads, you get almost 6x performance. Your speed up is 6. But if you keep adding more, your performance starts reducing in this database workflow. Whereas if you accelerate the critical sections, you could get a curve like this. And you know how to do this now, right? Okay, I will not cover this in more uh, detail. I guess. Basically, how do you accelerate critical sections? You can shift them to the large pool. And I will uh, let you go through this. Right? Has everybody read the paper? Yes? Maybe some of you did. I'll give you the basic idea. <laughs> some of you are sitting in class, so maybe I'll uh, go through that. So in the conventional system, when you get a critical section, you basically need to transfer the lock from one processor to the other processor. Whereas if you accelerate the critical section, you need some sort of scheduling buffer in the large core to keep track of the critical sections. And how does that work? This is called this critical section request buffer. When P2 encounters a critical section, that critical section is marked with a special instruction, critical section call. This P2 sends this critical section request to the critical section request buffer, and P1, which is the large core, executes the critical section. And hopefully it executes much faster than P2 would have executed. And when P1 is done, it sends this critical section dot signal to P2, so that P2 can now continue executing. Of course, this requires uh, support from many different uh, parts of the system. ISA needs to change. Uh, such that you have a critical section call instruction and a critical section return instruction. And somebody needs to insert these critical section call and return instructions. Um, uh, compiler and library is a good place to do that. Such that the programmer doesn't need to do that. The programmer certainly could do that, but if you require the programmer to do that, it may not be a good idea. And I already told you what happens. Uh, actually, I'll give you this example. Basically, the code needs to get transformed to from this version with lock and unlock. Uh, this is the critical section. 
and this is what the small core would execute normally. Uh, before doing the critical section call to the large core at the target PC, which is the beginning of the critical section, the arguments into the critical section needs to be pushed on the stack. So how does the critical section communicate with the non-critical section? Through the stack. It doesn't need to be that way, but this simplifies some things. That way critical section calls can be outlined. They could be functions. And a lot of library-based programming models uh, have critical sections as functions. If you, if you program with OpenMP, you have critical section function calls. And when this critical section call gets executed, it gets translated into a critical section call request that gets sent through the interconnect to a large form. So what, does, what gets sent? Uh, the log address, the pro target PC, the stack pointer, and the core ID that requests the critical section execution. And large core, in large core, it gets queued in this critical section request buffer, and at some point it becomes the head of that queue, which means the oldest critical section that was sent. And the large core takes uh, the critical section and starts executing from target program counter. And the code at target program counter first acquires a lock, and then pops the input to the critical section, which was pushed by the small core. And you know there's a name for this, right? That's a thread private data that gets input into the critical section. Or intersegment data, if you remember from the data marshalling. These are all familiar, right? Okay. And uh, that thread private data is used in this critical section call here. And at the end, the large core pushes the results onto the stack, releases the lock, and returns from the critical section. And this critical section return generates a critical section done response, which is sent to the core ID associated with the critical section request. And when the small core uh, gets the critical section done response, it pops the result that was produced by the large core, and I guess does whatever it needs to do with it. Yes. Um, you mentioned that the small core were getting terms while the large core is executing the um, critical section that it would wait for the um, large core to return and then service the network. That's right. Um, what happens if the critical section is really long and the interrupt is uh, like kind of critical? Yeah, you, you need better, so better support than what the paper suggests in that case. That's right. So it could like, tell the large core to abort. Yeah, you, can, you could certainly uh, do something like that. Right? If the interrupt is for that small core, maybe you have another mechanism that says abort the critical section. Of course, that complicates the system. Yeah. I think a better solution, perhaps, is to uh, have the interrupt redirected to some other core. Right? So you don't have to execute that interrupt in that core. So it can like, send the interrupt handler to the larger core? Or somewhere else, some other core. Some other core that's not waiting for this request. But that's a good question. There are system level issues that you need to handle uh, if you would like to design a system that uh, where the critical section waits. At some point, actually, in, in the multi threading lectures, uh, we will see that if you have a separate thread context in the small core, that thread context can handle the inner. We'll cover a paper called the use of. Uh, multi-threading for exception handling. And that's one of the benefits of multi-threading. If you get an interrupt in this core and you keep one thread uh, context active just to handle interrupts or do system level functions. And th that way you can handle the interrupts much better. But I think a better system level solution is actually to redirect the interrupts to particular cores that do not do this kind of Waiting. So basically you're specializing the core for interrupt handling. That's another case for asymmetry, if you will. That makes, that makes interrupt handling easier. And also potentially better, uh, because you have better locality in the interrupt service routines, depending on what interrupts you're handling. But interrupts are external to the what's running, right? 
when not that program, but interrupt can come from anywhere. Right? It could be a device that's interrupting. If it's a time critical interrupt, it has to. It may need to get service. Right? If it's a if it's a machine check interrupt, for example. <laughs> That's right, yeah. I mean, that's, but then that's, now you're putting the burden on the program. Yeah. So the system needs to handle that regardless of the length of the critical section. Yes? Simple to do. Otherwise, how, you, how would you figure out whether a critical section would execute faster? And that's the next step in research. Okay, so good questions. If you're interested in that interrupt handling in question, maybe you could do your project on that. <laughs> there are a lot of interesting issues actually related to that. And when you have multiple applications also put together, uh, not only this one, the one application executing. Course, but another application that has critical sections executing concurrently. Which one do you prioritize? That's another interesting issue. Okay. Yeah, you you uh, you already figured out the false serialization, hopefully, after reading the papers. One issue with this kind of system is uh, you can serialize independent critical sections because you're shipping all the critical sections into this large core and scheduling them in five order. Now, if you have two different critical sections that are independent of each other, critical section called A, another critical section called A, these need to be serialized. Of course, we'll cover some uh, work that actually parallelizes these also but later on. But to maintain the semantics of the lock, mutual exclusion, these need to be serialized. So that's fine. But if you get a critical section call request from some other core through block B, this doesn't need to wait for block A or critical section A to execute, right? But in this system, it does wait. So, as you remember from the paper, hopefully, there are saturating counters that keep track of how, how often does the serialization happen. And if it happens too often for a given critical section call, that critical section call stays in the small form. It's a reactive mechanism. You can imagine better mechanisms. But then the downside could be. Maybe this critical section is more important, right? Maybe it's better to execute that. So hopefully we'll uh, do better with the volatile card application and scheduling. Okay, so what are the pluses? You get faster critical section execution. There's another benefit of executing critical sections on the same place. It doesn't need, uh, it doesn't need to be a large core. It just needs to be the same place. And that's Shared locks stay in one place, right? You get better lock locality. The lock doesn't ping pong between different caches. And shared data also stays in hopefully large caches. So you get better shared data locality. Shared data doesn't ping pong. Because critical sections, the, things, uh, the code that accesses the shared data always executes on the same form. Minuses. If you actually dedicate the large core for critical sections, you get reduced parallel throughput. If you do not dedicate it, now you lose locality. Or if you have multi-threading to partially dedicate it, you may 
boost from the benefit of acceleration like while you're executing uh, uh, executing a critical section if you're executing something else also then you lose the benefit of uh, some of the benefit of acceleration because you don't have full resources in large for executing the critical section another minus is uh, the transfer overhead right it says lock state in one place better, you get better lock locality but locks are kind of transformed into this critical section call and critical section dump signals. And there's some overhead for that. The good news is that if the critical section is actually contended, that overhead is not on the critical path. Because while you're sending this critical section call to the large part, another instance of the critical section is executing on the large part. So you're overlapping that latency of execution with the transfer overhead. So it makes sense to do this for contended. Whereas if a critical section is not contended, this overhead becomes on the critical path, right? Because you're sending a critical section that's not contended to large form. You're just delaying this thread. And uh, you already read a paper about this thread private data. This data that we pushed, right? A, that we pushed uh, on the stack needs to be transferred to the large form. Which means that you get worse private data locality. The data that's needed by the critical section, you get worse locality. This was not a problem if you were executing critical sections on the same call. But hopefully, as you read the uh, data marshaling paper, you see that it's an easier problem to solve. Why is it an easier problem to solve? Because you can identify the data that needs to be transferred to the critical section, to the large core early, and push that data or marshal that data large form. Whereas it's much harder to predict which shared data you're going to touch, or which core is going to touch the shared data. You can imagine ways of doing that, but it's very tough. People have tried to uh, build mechanisms. There's a body of literature that tries to predict where should, uh, which thread is going to uh, touch the shared data next and speculatively push that data to that thread form. And it turns out the accuracy of those mechanisms is not very high. Whereas the accuracy of data marshaling, you can tell me what it is. Now this is the pop quiz to see if you've actually read the paper. You guys remember the accuracy of data marshaling? 60? Is it that low? Could be actually. I think coverage was high, accuracy was relatively low. I don't know what your numbers. Okay. <coughs> well, you don't know which data statically. Right? Data, data addresses are not available statically. And you have control flow that's changing dynamics, but it cannot be 100% accurate. Of your control flow is always right, always the same. Okay, you can you can look at the uh, paper again. Okay, we've covered these trade-offs. This is very similar to the trade-offs that we have in ACMP. You have fewer parallel threads versus accelerated critical sections, but you can amortize that. You have the overhead of critical section call and critical section dump versus the better lock locality. And this turns out to be better, uh, a good trade-off if the critical section is contested, as I said earlier. And we get more private, more cache misses for private data versus fewer misses for shared data because we're keeping the shared data on the large core. Uh, this is a problem. Uh, in general, uh, actually there is no general statement, but usually it makes sense. When I think of it, it makes sense to have uh, more cache misses. Uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, shared data that a thread touches, the critical section touches, is greater than the private data. That's not always the case, interestingly. Uh, but let me give you an example. Let's say you're inserting, this is your private data that you're inserting into a priority heap, and heap is a big heap. When you're, and this is a critical section, you, you, this insertion is a critical section because this heap is shared by many threads. 
if you're going to do this insertion, the only private data element is this new node that you're inserting. But the shared data elements that you touch is quite a bit, quite a few. So this is like, uh, what I would normally think of when you have pr private data versus shared data. But it turns out <laughs> in some cases you add a lot more shared data, uh, private data into a small set of private shared data that you touch. So this is a trade-off. And transfers is reduced if shared data is greater than private data. Shared data that's touched is greater than private data that's touched. And we will get back to this, or you can tell me what it is. So you've seen the performance results. Uh, I'll go over this quickly. The comparison points are symmetric multi-core, asymmetric multi-core, where uh, you have conventional marking, but large part exterior the serial part, and exterior the critical sections. And there are 12 critical section intensive workloads uh, from different domains, uh, simulated on a multi-core simulator. And these are the characteristics of the large core and small core, as you read in the paper. The main difference is large core is auto border with a reasonable size instruction window and a longer, deeper pipeline is wider. Whereas small core is wimpy, just like uh, Sun Niagara. So you can put many of those. And this is the entrepreneur unit. And if you look at the performance improvements, you can divide the benchmarks workloads into workloads with coarse grain locks, where the programmer did not put much effort into optimizing the, the critical sections. If the programmer doesn't put any effort, they can do a lock at the beginning of the program and at the end of the program, unlock at the end of the program, right? At the end of the thread. And everything is serialized. That's a coarse grain lock. If the programmer puts a lot of effort, and the locks are fine grain, meaning they try to minimize the size of the critical sections, such that there are a few instructions, if it's possible. It may not be possible, right, because it's also dependent on your data. But then the program can optimize the data. For example, if your shared uh, data structure is a huge tree, or huge priority, how does the programmer ensure that uh, you get uh, small critical sections when you're up, when some, some threads updating the updating that heap. Well, you can partition that heap such that different parts of the heap is protected by different locks. Okay. That way you can reduce the size of each critical section. But you can imagine how much programming effort that requires, especially in a data structure like a heap. Well, you can write that. Maybe that, but maybe that should be an assignment in this course. Though. <laughs> writing, a, <laughs> writing a much more parallel E <laughs> than a single block. Well, an easy way of protecting that heap is whenever someone, before someone access, before a thread access that heap, you have a lock. And you update that, that thread out, updates that heap, or reads that heap, and it unlocks it. But you could do it much more fine You could not block every node. Of course, there's an overhead associated with that. But that is the finest way you can get, perhaps. Same as hash tables, right? Hash tables, again. That's, that's easier to parallelize. If you have a hash table, you can lock every bucket. Have a lock associated with every bucket. That's much easier to reason a lot also than a key. So, yeah, fine grain locks, uh, programmer optimized both. And if you look at this performance graph, when you have coarse grain locks, the speed up that you get uh, with exterior critical sections is significant compared to both symmetric multi-core and asymmetric multi-core. This is called acceleration sequential kernels, but it's really accelerating the serial part of the program. That's ACM. And the performance benefit is significant. I'd like to emphasize that this is very important. This is actually very, very important. If you're doing your projects, uh, the, the comparison points here for symmetric multi-core, asymmetric multi-core, and exterior critical sections, uh, first of all, they're all equal area systems with some definition of equal area. But the number of threads of a program on a given system is the number of threads that provides the best performance on that system. So for example, when we run puzzle application. 
on the symmetric multi-core system, maybe the best number of threads is eight. And here we have 32 small cores. And when we run it on ACMP system, the best number of threads is nine. And when we run it on ACS, maybe the best number of threads is 15. Those are the comparison points. The comparison point is not 15 for all. Because if you do 15 for all, what will happen? Any guesses? The baseline symmetric multi-core system is not performing the best at 15 threads, right? Because the application is not scalable to 15 threads in the symmetric multi-core system. So you really need to pick the best threads. This may not be easy to do, actually, in real life. In real life, how do you decide what's the best number of threads? Even that is dynamic, depending on the resource contention. If you're interested in that, uh, you can read this paper. You can do a project on that. Author Suleiman wrote another paper called Feedback Driven Threading. Into the system dynamically decides the number of threads. dynamically decide the number of threads that you actually execute in a program. Depending on where, you, what is your scalability model? Right? But when you're doing the comparisons, you have to do the pair comparison. Because you could, and at other point you could compare it, you can assume that it's all 32 threads, right? All the applications are 32. Uh, every one of them has 32 threads because of the system. Again, that's not a fair comparison. Why? Well, I guess I'll show you why. Because of this. Because if you look at an application at 32 thread points, if you look here, for example, the performance gain that we get from accelerated critical sections looks huge, right? The baseline with 32 threads is its performance is here. Uh, the ACMP with 30 threads, its performance is here. And ACS with 30 threads, is, the performance is great. But nobody would execute this program with 32 threads on the baseline. And to effectively nobody who's, at least nobody who's sane would do that. Because that's, obviously you can execute this program with 16 threads and get much better performance than with 32 threads. Right? So you're going to be careful when you're doing these parallel performance comparisons. Okay. So if you look at the fine grain locks, the performance benefit of XA critical section is not very high. It's still high, because there is, there is some contention. Uh, and they're not as fine grained. The locks are not as fine grained as we would like them to be, perhaps. Maybe the programmer did not put enough effort. Uh, or maybe it was not easy. Uh, well, they're, they're the same thing, almost. And the performance benefit is not as high. But overall, the performance benefit is about 40% uh, compared to symmetric multiple, and maybe around 30% compared to asymmetric multiple. You've seen these results. And scalability of multiple benchmarks, seven of the 12 workloads improved. What does that mean? Uh, scalable, uh, scalability improved means that the number of threads at which performance saturates increases. So here, if you look at the, I'll take the same example, the online transaction processing workload, uh, the green, the number of threads where the performance of the symmetric multi-core system saturates is, I don't know, can you guys see that? 16? Okay. You have a good eyes. <laughs> and the number of threads where the performance of the ACS system saturates is probably somewhere between 24 and 32. So that's the scalability of that workload improved. You could add more threads and get better performance. Okay, so that's the summary. Critical sections reduce performance and limit scalability. And if you execute them at a powerful core, you can improve both performance and scalability. Another, of course, shortcoming of this work, and you, uh, you've seen improvements on it with bottleneck identification and scheduling. I think I'll cover that, and then we'll end the lecture after that. But think about other ways of improving it. Right? Here, uh, we may be shipping the critical section to the large core, but that may not be improving performance. And large core may not be the best way to improve the 
performance of that critical section. If this critical section is really important, maybe you design a core that's optimized for executing these critical sections. The question is, how, what would that look like? That could be an interesting research topic, right? Because this is the bottleneck of your program. That's what you want to accelerate. And maybe these bottlenecks have similar characteristics. And if you can design specialized cores to accelerate these bottlenecks, maybe you can get much better systems than what we have today. Large core is just one easy way of doing it because we do not know how to accelerate the bottlenecks otherwise. So if you want to generalize the idea, we would like to accelerate all the bottlenecks, not only critical sections. And that's the next step. And you read the paper. This is a very brief summary of the paper. Uh, you already know that performance and scalability of multi-threaded applications uh, are bottlenecked or limited by serializing bottlenecks. And there are different types of them. Critical sections, barriers, small pipeline stages. And the importance of this bottleneck actually changes over time. Uh, you can have different bottlenecks that become more important. And as you read the paper, you know that. So the goal of this work is to dynamically identify the most important bottlenecks and accelerate them. Uh, there are two key questions, of course. How do you identify the most critical bottlenecks? And when you say critical bottleneck, I'd like to think of the bottleneck that is on the critical path of execution. Basically, if you, if you accelerate it, you will definitely gain performance. And at some point in time, some code that's executing in a parallel application must be on the critical path of execution. In a single thread program, some instructions are on the critical path of execution. Some instructions may not be because you execute them out of order and their latency may be hidden. Here you have multiple threads. Some threads are on the critical path, some threads may not be. So how do you identify these most critical bottlenecks and how do you efficiently accelerate them? So the solution that you read is bottleneck identification and scheduling. Again, it's hardware software cooperative. If you can do this purely in hardware, that's another research topic. And Intel would be very interested in you. <laughs> because that's, this is a real problem they're facing. And if you can find a way of purely doing this, doing whatever is done purely in hardware, maybe, you, maybe you'll be like the next branch predictor person <laughs> in the 90s. <laughs> that, that would be the analogy. <laughs> so software annotates the bottlenecks with bottleneck call and bottleneck return instructions, and it implements waiting for bottlenecks with a special instruction, bottleneck wait. And hardware uses these special instructions and identifies the bottlenecks that cause the most thread waiting using this bottleneck wait instruction and accelerates those bottlenecks on large cores of an asymmetric multi core system. And it turns out this improves multi thread application performance and scalability beyond what accelerated critical sections can do. And performance improves with more cores also. So I've already, already shown you. Uh, the idea is to generalize these bottlenecks, right? Extended critical sections handle only this, but we want to generalize more. And if you can generalize more, that's another research direction. What else is missing here? Right? What are the other bottlenecks in a parallel application? For example, this doesn't include the resource contention bottlenecks. So that's, that's an obvious next step. So one observation uh, in this paper is limiting bottlenecks change over time. And I'll give you a cooked up example. And whenever you have these observations, it's always good to come up with cooked up examples. It doesn't matter if it's a cooked up example. Whatever you cook up, you should know that there is a programmer in the world who will cook up that for a real problem. <laughs> or cook up something like that. Because there's so much software out there, and there will be programmers that are writing something, some similar code. So this is a cooked up example where you have a start. Each thread does this. We start with a full linked list A, and we're going to copy elements uh, from uh, that linked list to an empty linked list B. And each thread takes one element and copies it to uh, uh, the next linked list. So there's a lock in which the thread traverses list A and removes an element from A, does some computation on that element, and locks the next list, list B, and inserts uh, that element into that list. It's cooked up, right? 
But you can imagine programs potentially doing this. Maybe you're copying data in some way. Maybe you do some more operations to figure out what is X. Maybe you don't move the entire link this from one to the other. Okay. So this is a critical section, obviously, with multiple threads trying to access this link list will fit that thread. And this is another critical section. If you look at the execution of this program with 32 threads that are started in parallel, initially this link list is full, and there's lots of contention on this link list. The y-axis is contention in terms of the number of threads that are waiting for this lock. And initially, there are many threads waiting for lock A, so lock A is the limiter. But soon after, after 10 million cycles or so, lock B starts becoming the limiter. Because this list become, starts becoming populated. And because you have a single large lock that protects the entire list, uh, every thread that's trying to lock it will need to wait for the thread that's currently inserting into this. So this shows that limiting bottlenecks change over time. And there are some cases where it's not clear what is the bottleneck. And what do you do in that case? We accelerate both if you want to improve performance. And this is an example, you've seen this in the paper, from a real application, MySQL, uh, with 16 threads that shows two locks or two critical sections in this uh, real application. And it shows the contention on the critical sections and how many threads are waiting. And if you look at some portions of the code that are very fine grain, this is millions of cycles and the maximum is 8 million. At a very fine grain, the bottlenecks change very quickly. It's the log line, this is the database log. That's the bottleneck here. That's making many threads content. And some, in some other parts, it's the open lock, where you're opening the database tables that is making lots of threads content. And this is uh, dynamically changing very quickly. So you already know some of the previous work. Uh, HTMP accelerates <coughs> And the ball of serial parts, right? Accelerate critical sections, accelerates only critical sections. But it also has another shortcoming that we briefly talked about. It doesn't take into account the importance of critical sections, as you mentioned. It just gets to a critical section and stupidly ships it to the large form. Simple. And at the time it was good, but now it sounds stupid after you're reading the uh, bottleneck identification and scheduling paper. Right? This is like you finding. CM5 paper, <laughs> not very smart. Now, now I look back on our previous work, I find it not very smart. Right? And that's how it should be. That's how you improve right, in research. So it doesn't take into account the importance of critical sections. And there's another work that I would recommend you to read. This is the feedback method pipeline. Basically, how do you accelerate pipeline based parallel program? Basically, what it does is it's a software based library that figures out which pipeline stage, is it A, B, or C, is, has the lowest throughput, meaning is the slowest one that's making other stages wait. One way you could figure that out is how many A's are queued, right? That could be one way. Another way of figuring out uh, that is there are queues between A, B, and C. So when you're communicating between A and B, there's a software queue. So when, when this A executes, it uh, pushes its result into the software queue where the next instance of B can pop the result. So if that queue gets full, you know that B is not going fast. And the software-based library can figure out which stage has the lowest throughput and ship that stage to a large core instead of executing it at a small core. That's one way of accelerating a pipeline-based parallel program. But the downside is, because it's software based, it's, it cannot adapt to these fine grade changes. Okay. So, no previous work can actually have all these three types of bottlenecks or quickly adapt to fine grade changes. And you know the uh, general mechanism, hopefully. I don't think I'll be able to go into detail in the remaining time. Uh, but the general we want the general mechanism to identify the performance limiting bottlenecks and accelerate them on the large form. I guess I'll cover just uh, this also. A key insight is, at least in this work, and I encourage you to improve on this insight because it's, it doesn't, it's not flawless. There are better ways of doing this. 
The key side is trade weighting cause reduced spiral is likely to reduce performance. If we can identify the code that's causing the most trade weighting, it's likely on the critical path. If you can dynamically identify bottlenecks that cause the most trade, trade weighting, and if you can accelerate that, you would be accelerating the critical path. That's the key idea. And we would like to do that. The question is how do you do this? You already know this. Uh, basically, the compiler, library, and the program annotates the bottleneck code and implements waiting for bottlenecks with special instructions and generates a binary containing these instructions. And the hardware measures how much waiting each bottleneck causes using these bottleneck weight instructions and accelerates the bottlenecks with the highest thread weight cycles. And I think I'll go quickly into this. So, how do you actually uh, annotate the bottlenecks? This is a critical section, right? Critical section is outlined into a function, and you get a bottleneck call that identifies the critical section, bottleneck ID generic, and target PC, this is the beginning of the critical section, and the critical section is delineated with the bottleneck return from the bottleneck ID. And this waiting for the critical section, if you cannot acquire the lock, if the lock is busy, somebody else has the lock, and this waiting that's normally implemented as software now is moved into hardware. The hardware has an instruction that's, uh, that takes a bottleneck ID and an address to watch. When that address changes, when somebody else finishes its critical section, it updates that watch address. When that address changes, this bottleneck now becomes a waitable. Uh, well, this, this instruction wakes up the thread that's waiting on that ball. And this is used to keep track of thread waiting cycles. And these are used to enable acceleration because they delineate the bottleneck. And you can think of the same thing for barriers. I think I'll cover this and then we'll stop there. Uh, and then you, you already know. I don't, the paper doesn't describe this in detail. Did you guys understand it? How you can do, how you can identify bottlenecks with barriers. So this is a, a very common barrier code. A thread enters the barrier. And while uh, not all threads are in the barrier, it just waits. Right? And then it exits the barrier and can continue with whatever it's doing. But this is really the code running for the barrier. Right? This is the parallel part. So if you think of this is, this is the barrier. You have some code running here. And that code is here. So you have a bottleneck code to that code. And at the end of that code, there's a bottleneck return that goes back, and the thread now enters the barrier. That's where, that's where the bottleneck is. And it starts waiting if, there, if there's at least one thread that is not at the barrier. That's where the bottleneck wait instruction comes in. When the thread starts waiting, you get a bottleneck wait instruction uh, that's executed. Okay. And you can do this for pipeline spaces as well. And this is what a pipeline stage looks like. Basically, you have, uh, you have this A part of the code that does the work and gets input from the previous stage. And how does it get input? It, it reads a queue. It dequeues some work. If, there's a, if the queue is empty, it cannot dequeue some work because nobody produced that work yet. And at the end, after doing the work, it's input. It outputs its result into an output queue which somebody else, some other stage, will read. And it cannot output because the queue is full. It waits. It's full. And you can measure whether it's full because of an empty queue, or because of an empty input queue, or because of a full output queue, using these bottleneck instructions. And you can know which bottleneck is causing the wait. If, you're, if the uh, input queue is empty, then the previous, previous stage pipeline stage is causing the problem, right? It's making this thread wait. If the output queue is full, then the next pipeline stage is causing the problem because it's not taking results quickly enough. That's how you increment uh, the thread waiting cycles and associate them with a bottleneck that's actually causing waiting for a given thread. Okay. I think I gave you more detail on the paper did on this particular topic. 
But once you have this uh, bond equivalence character, the hardware can actually measure the thread waiting cycles when it act executes that bond equivalence construction. <laughs> uh, and once uh, it figures out which bottleneck has the highest waiting cycles, basically there's a table that associates bottleneck ID with number of waiting cycles. And if a bottleneck is causing lots of waiting cycles, it can get shipped to the large one. But I think let's stop here, because they're going to kick us out.